In a day when it seems like everything is negotiable and nothing is absolute, this is God's word. I believe it. I follow it. What it says is true. What it says about sexuality is true. What it says about right and wrong is true. What it says about sin is true. What it says about heaven is true. What it says about salvation is true. What it says about hell is true. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what critics say. Will you accept the word of God for what it is, the truth? The title of the message is, What Matters Most? What Matters Most? You come to Acts chapter 20, and Paul is saying goodbye to his friends at Ephesus. Remember, there was really a world-class revival, one of the greatest awakenings and moves of God in the history of the church. As literally... People across Asia came to Christ. It so upended Ephesus that people who made idols were going to go out of business. They were afraid they started a riot. Paul not only is seeing miracles there, but we know as he goes up into Illyricum, north of Asia, that there are miracles there. He says that in Romans chapter 15. It's a time of exceptional supernatural power in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But now he's headed to Jerusalem and he will tell them in this address that he will never see them again. Acts chapter 20, verse 23, this is the key verse, verse 24. The Holy Spirit has let me know repeatedly and clearly that there are hard times and imprisonment ahead. But that matters little. When you can make this statement and say that statement then you know that Christ really is the most important thing to you. What matters most to me is to finish what God started, the job the Master Jesus gave me of letting everyone I meet know all about this incredibly extravagant generosity of God. Paul says... I don't care what happens to me. What matters most to me is that the people I come in contact with know how much God loves them and know what Jesus did for them. That's what mattered to Paul. So I want to start this message by helping us to do a little inventory. I've been doing it the last two weeks as I've been studying this passage, but I want to ask you, what matters most to you? When people you spend your time with, when they hear you talk, and they see how you live, and they get a sense of what you're passionate about, what would they conclude matters most to you? Your golf score, the boat on the lake, your job, your hair, your nails, your car, your lawn, the Chiefs. I had to throw that in there. (laughs) What matters most to you? As Paul says goodbye to the Ephesians elders, he looks back over his life, and what he does is this is what matters most. He's saying that there. But he's going to talk about how he lives his life because everything in the way he lives his life points to this. And as we look at it, Paul gives us six things that mattered most to him as he's, as he's talking to people he's never going to see again. And he wants to say to them, listen, this is what's been important to me. And I want to encourage you with that to follow me as I follow Christ. He says that over and over again in his epistles. So as we look at this, we're going to look at six things that mattered most to Paul. Just one word for each one of them. Number one, humility. Look at it, Acts 20 and verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So he doesn't stop at Ephesus. He's sailing over from Macedonia. He passes the the harbor of Ephesus because he's afraid if he stops there, he's going to be delayed. 
So he goes on by it, stops at a town by the name of Miletus, sends for the elders of the Ephesian church, which incidentally is a great church. It's the only church that when you read in the New Testament epistles, it is the only church during the time of Paul that, that there's an epistle written to that there's no correction given to them. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. He says, I serve the Lord with great humility. It's one thing to be a servant, and, and, and really when we're talking about servant there, the word is doulos, it's bond slave. It's, a, it's the lowest of servants. It's a servant who has absolutely no rights. In fact, Paul will say to the Corinthians, and, and I don't have it here, but he'll say in chapter 4, I think it's verse 1, he'll say, this is how men should regard us as slaves or servants of Christ. And there the word is a galley slave, like a slave rowing a Roman galley. That's how you should view me. As, as somebody whose life is, is gone in terms of wanting to do what he wants to do. He's rowing. Paul says, I served, and, and I wasn't just acting like a servant, but I served with humility. Humility mattered to him. When we're talking about humility, we're not talking about the idea, oh, I'm nothing, and oh, I can't do anything. That's not humility, that's insecurity, which is the same, honestly, as an inverted pride. When we're talking about humility, Romans chapter 12, Paul says this, verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed to each of you. So the idea is you understand what God has given you faith to do in your life, and he's given faith to everyone to do something for him. And you're like, well, you know what? I don't have all the gifts, but I have these gifts that God has given me the faith to believe he can use me in this way. Honestly, C.S. Lewis put it this way. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Andrew Murray, the devotional writer, basically condensed it down to humility is dependence upon God. And so you could say, Paul's saying, I, I have great dependence upon God. I, he serves him the whole time, realizing that unless God helped him do it, he couldn't do it. Second Corinthians 3, Paul said, it's not that we think we're qualified to do anything on our own. Listen, if you wait till you think you're qualified, you'll do nothing. The life of Christianity isn't the life of the qualified, it's the life of the unqualified or previously disqualified who through the grace of God are used by God to do more than they could have ever imagined through his power that works in us. That's what Paul is saying. It's how Paul lived. He serves the Lord with Humility. I want to ask you a question. Do you see yourself as a servant of God? Do you see yourself as a bond slave? Do you see yourself as a galley servant so that it's not about what you want to do? It's about what he has called you to do. And everybody's called to do something for him if you know him. Do you understand what he wants of you? And are you willing to give him an unqualified yes and say, Lord, whatever it is, I'm here. That's how Paul served with humility. Second, he served with tears. Acts 20, verse 19, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. Listen, there's this idea that somehow men don't cry. That's not true. Jesus wept. He was the greatest man there was. Paul, as tough as any man you're ever going to meet, was tender toward the Lord. His service to God involved tears. You say, what did he cry about? Well, I think there's four things. Number one, he cried because people were lost. Romans 9, 2, I have great sorrow and increasing anguish in my heart. He's crying over the, the state of the Jewish people. I could wish that myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. 
It broke his heart that people didn't know Jesus. I want to ask you, the people you know that don't know Jesus, does it bother you enough to shed a tear? If it doesn't, it's because you've, you, you have failed to understand the reality of, of the terrible, permanent nature of hell. Because if we really understood hell as Jesus describes it, as the Bible describes it, we not only wouldn't want people to go there, we would weep if we knew they were. He cried over carnal Christians. He wept over Christians who were complacent, who cared more about their personal comfort than they did about the cause of Christ. He, he wept over indulgent Christians, self-centered Christians. He wrote the book of 1 Corinthians to the biggest bunch of carnal Christians you could imagine, but the entire time he wrote, he wept. 2 Corinthians I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. He loved them so much, but it bothered them to, him to see them living so far below the level God had for them. 30 cried over people who tear the church apart. He says in Philippians, for as I've often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And we're not talking about people who don't know God. We're talking about people who do, or at least claim to. It's a tragic thing when Christians tear other Christians apart. When they, when they do what they do, whether it's social media or somewhere else, you say, oh, you're talking about what people say about you. Say what you want, but it's tragic for the church. And I'm not talking about James River. I'm talking about the bigger church. There's nothing more ungodly and, and awful than Christians who shoot at one another because they've forgotten who the enemy really is. And for Paul, it caused him tears and sorrow. Fourth, he cried because he spent so much time in God's presence that there was a brokenness. You say, what do you mean? As, as a person spends time with the Lord, often God works into their heart a, a tenderness to the Lord that, that comes out as tears. Look at this in Acts 20 and verse 31, remembering that night, night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. I mean, in him, there was a, a well of, of compassion for the people, and he wept. So I was studying this. I was reminded of the story of Robert Murray McShane, one of the great preachers in Scotland in the 1800s. And the story is told of a pastor who went to visit the church where Robert Murray McShane had preached, and the custodian there was showing him around. The church in which he was preached was visited by a young pastor. The custodian brought him into the little room, showed him a little stool. The old custodian said, sir, do you see that stool? The young pastor thought it's strange to be shown a stool. The custodian said that is the stool where Pastor McShane would kneel and weep before he preached. Then he took him to the pulpit. The young man saw a great Bible covered with water stains. He said, what is all that on the Bible? The custodian said, those are the tears that Brother McShane would shed while he preached. The psalmist says this, Psalm 126, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. In other words, the person carrying the word of God to people, if they have a compassionate and a caring heart, there will always be a harvest. Um, you know, people ask me about my voice. I'm, I'm hesitant to tell you this, but I just want to explain it. Um, during this season, I spend a lot of time crying for you, for people, for the area. I was in Highland Springs with somebody from the church. And we started talking about the area, and I began to sob uncontrollably at the table. I was so... I mean, I was just like, what are people thinking? I'm sure he was like, what in the world? <laughs> I'm just telling you that 
my voice is, it's affected my voice. The drainage on my, on my vocal cords is, has irritated my voice to the point that, that my voice is hoarse. And I, I'm not saying it to say, look at me. I'm giving it as an explanation. I, I don't know whether I will in any other service, but um, God is working in a way I've never seen in my whole ministry and in my life in a way I've never experienced. <sighs> Persecution, number three. He was willing to endure hardships and insults for the sake of Christ. Acts 20, verse 19. I've endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. And now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, and I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Let me just say this, the Holy Spirit's speaking to him, and next week we're going we're gonna to see prophets prophesying to him, and we're going to be talking about personal prophecy, and what do we do? How do we understand that? How does that work? Because I think there's a place for that in the believer's life. And so we're going to talk about some of that. But here Paul says, I've endured trials and I know there are more on the way. I mean, this is a man who was continually persecuted. I don't have time to take you to 2 Corinthians 11, but you read it there, verses 25 and following, you know, uh, three, five times from the Jews, he received the 40 lashes minus one. So five times he was beaten with 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. He was in prison. He was stoned, left for dead. People not only abused him physically, but they maligned him. They made fun of him. They talked about him. They lied about him. And Paul says this, and listen, everybody's got to get this settled in your heart. And, and this, is the, this is the raw truth about Christianity. Jesus said it in John 15. A servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If you don't want to be persecuted, Christianity's not for you. You say, well, why would I want to be a Christian? Because knowing him is worth more than anything in the world. Amen. Nothing compares. And we'd rather have him than have the world's esteem. We'd rather have him than have riches and gold. We'd rather have him, period. Paul says in 2 Timothy, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Everyone. So maybe if you work in a secular place and nobody says anything to you about anything, it's because they don't even know you're a Christian. Listen, this is... People are going to say what they're going to say, and you can't let it bother you. You got to say, listen, they keep, they can say what they want, but I'm serving Jesus, period. Number four, witness. Witness. I've spent the last two weeks thinking about this. It mattered to Paul where people would spend eternity. In Acts 20 and verse 26, I declare today that I've been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. In the NIV, therefore I declare to you today I'm innocent of the blood of all men. That really raises the question, honestly, if we read this too fast, we're tempted to say, well, good for you, Paul. But the issue is, are you and I accountable for the blood of people who go to hell? Paul obviously felt there was an accountability there. Are we guilty of another person's blood? Let me put it to you this way. We're guilty of another person's blood if we do not tell them the gospel when the Holy Spirit urges us to tell them the gospel. You know, I'm going to tell you, this is not the place you go if you want to be comfortable. I'm just going to tell you. I will make you very uncomfortable, probably at least once a month, maybe more. Um, because the Bible makes people uncomfortable. Are you with us? Jesus walks into a temple. He's going to turn over a few tables. 
He's going to disrupt a few things. And sometimes we get too complacent for our own good relative to the fate of the lost around us. And the lost around us are everywhere. And our, our city is going to hell in a handbasket. And so is Joplin. Missouri is in the top three states for domestic abuse in the country, and they say our numbers are soft. And Springfield's number one. So this idea there's churches everywhere and we're in the Bible Belt and somehow we, we don't have a responsibility because it's all being done is ridiculous. I'm simply saying you, none of us are ever going to cry out to God for the lost if we don't feel responsible for them or feel compassion for their soul. When the Holy Spirit urges us to talk to people about salvation and we don't do it, we will be accountable for their blood. You say, well, John, I mean, if Jesus forgives us of everything, then, then how are we held accountable? We're not really told here, but in Ezekiel 33, it gives us some sense. Now, son of man, I'm making you a watchman for the people of Israel. Therefore, listen to what I say and warn them for me. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then they will die in their sins and I'll hold you responsible for their deaths. I mean, that's pretty shocking. Verse 9 says this, but if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself. Now listen, Jesus can cleanse us from all sin, even the sin of having the blood of people's eternal damnation on our hands, and who of us potentially doesn't have that? But if we persist in disobeying the voice of the Spirit time and again, and we ignore his prompting to share Christ with him, it may prove in the end we don't belong to Christ at all. And therefore, his blood hasn't cleansed us from sin, and the lostness of those we didn't share Christ with will be added to our own judgment and eternal damnation. Listen, you don't have to reach everybody, but you do have to reach the people he tells you to. And he is talking to you about that because he cares about that more than anything. This is why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is why we need the Lord to come on us in such a power and to such a degree that we move from being chickens to being bold. That we move from being afraid we're going to offend people and what people will think about us to saying, I care more about your soul and you will thank me in heaven for what I did and you'll remember me in hell for what I did. <laughs> Listen, this is Christianity 101. If this offends you, you, you didn't get the memo. If it makes you feel oppressed, on your heart, it's because the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, this is what I'm concerned about. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm just saying, listen, it, it, we've got to own what the Scripture teaches. And Acts is all about the power of the Holy Spirit working miraculously in the lives of people to reach the lost. That's what it's about. Number five, biblical. Acts 20, 27, for I have not hesitated to proclaim, you could say, to shout out, to cry aloud to you the whole will of God. What mattered to Paul was that people understood the will of God, the counsel of God, the word of God. So he lived it, he studied it, he taught it, he shared it with people, not just the parts he liked, and everybody has parts we like, but he shared the parts he liked and the parts that were harder for people to like. 
I mean, this is the job of the pastor. This is it right here to teach the word of God. And honestly, this has been the driving force behind my ministry from the beginning. That, that I would be able to say, first of all, to God, I've not failed to declare the whole counsel of God. It's what drove me to go from Matthew to Revelation, verse by verse. How else could you know it unless we did it that way? We need to hear all of it. The parts that are fun and interesting, the parts that seem dry and dull, the parts in between. We need to know it. And I will give an account to God, to the one whose eyes burn with fire, and so will every teacher of the word of God. Paul said, listen, I'm going to give the whole counsel of God. And the question for us is, will you and I believe it in a day when, when it seems like everything is negotiable and nothing is absolute? Will you accept the word of God for what it is, the truth? Or will you pick and choose what you want to believe? That's not the Bible. That's not the counsel of God. And it's not God's will for you. God's will is that you take the Bible and say, this is God's word. I believe it. I follow it. What it says is true. What it says about sexuality is true. What it says about right and wrong is true. What it says about sin is true. What it says about heaven is true. What it says about salvation is true. What it says about hell is true. And it doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what critics say. It doesn't matter. We're committed to the word of God. And I refuse to de-emphasize anything in the scripture just because the culture doesn't like it and it's not popular. And let me say this, lest anybody wonders, well, that's the dad. What are the sons going to be like? They are as committed right down the line. And you can count on it. They will cut it straight and step on your toes and slap you in the face and put their arms around you and weep with you, they will do it all. <sighs> Generosity. Acts 20 and verse 35. Some of you are new today and you're like, oh my gosh, what, what did I get into? <laughs> Just so you know, I'm really glad you're here, but I'm completely unapologetic about anything I've said. Um, and I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. We make a living by what we get, someone has said. We make a life by what we give. Generosity mattered to Paul. It mattered to him how much he gave. Does it matter to you? And I'm not talking in the matter of matter in the way of, oh, I, I just, it's so hard to give. I, no, I'm talking about, are you excited to give? When you give the check to missions, when I write it, I look at it and I say, Lord, I don't know how many people will be touched by this, but Lord, touch as many as you can, and I can't wait to see them in heaven. You know, whenever we give, when we give to the youth center, I don't know how many students are going to be touched through that. I, I think it's a really hard thing to calculate, but I do know this. I was talking to one of the people who teaches our college students, and he said, I'm telling you what, this class, he said, in my, in my spirit, and he's taught a lot of years. He said, these people are going to change the world. Yeah. 
He said, I know they're going to change the world. He said their love for God is very, very unusual. A lot of those kids are coming out of our student ministry. Generosity mattered to Paul. Listen, I, I'm just suggesting to you that it should matter to every believer. The only thing you'll keep is what you give. I'm not talking about your tithe. I'm talking about the tithe is the baseline. I mean, come on. It's the bottom line. And I realize that's a step of faith for people. But when you take it, the testimonies, we don't make these up. And we have multiple testimonies we could read to you any given week on tithing. So it, the, the, the testimonies of people validates the message that as you trust God with your finances, he'll bless you. It's true. But I'm talking about what, what, what are you willing to give over and above to, to a world that, that desperately needs it? What are you willing to invest? And, and, you know, when we talk about it, we talk about Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So, so Jerusalem for us is, is like the youth center. What are you willing to give to change kids' lives? What are you willing to give to make Serve Saturday an over-the-top success? And I'm telling you, it's going to make a difference on Springfield and Joplin. What are you willing to give to see churches planted in the U.S.? What are you willing to give to, to see churches planted overseas and see wells dug and, and communities established in areas that might be hostile to the gospel without that? I just want to ask you, what, what matters to me, to you? Do you care that people will go to an eternal hell if they don't know Jesus? Listen, when we love Jesus, we love what Jesus loves and we love who Jesus loves. And we care about the things he cares about. And he cares so much about where people will spend eternity that he came to die on a cross. So that people could have eternal life with him. What matters to you? When your life is over, if the Lord tarries and your life is done, what are people going to say mattered to you? Are they going to name a bunch of things that aren't wrong in and of themselves, but are trivial in light of eternity? Is there anything about your life that's going to speak that, hey, this, this man, this woman, they, they live for eternity. That's what they cared about. I think it's good for us to think about these things. What matters most? We need to make sure we're building our lives on things that will matter in eternity for sure. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.